part one. This man right here is Marcus Amortis, and you can see he's carrying Carol Danvers, back when she was Miss Marvel. Marcus Amortis is the future son of a version of Kang the Conqueror, and in the Avengers, he hooks up with Captain Marvel, but it gets a lot worse. Because you see, he was trapped in limbo, and when he hooked up with her, she got pregnant with him. Yeah, that's right. This man forcibly impregnated Miss Marvel with a version of himself so he could be born outside of limbo and carry on as normal. What the heck, Marvel? Part two. This is Old Man Logan, which many of us are familiar with with the 2017 film. However, that film left out a very key character, that being Bruce Banner, the Hulk. In this comic, he's really not like he is in the MCU. In fact, this version of the Hulk did one of the most despicable things in comics. That being, having all of these evil children, known as the Hulk Gang. But who did he have them with? The only person that would be able to withstand his gamma radiation. That, unfortunately, being She-Hulk, his own cousin. Ugh. Part 3. This is Kyle Rayner. He is one of the most popular Green Lanterns in modern history. And this is Kyle's girlfriend, Alexandra DeWitt. She was introduced in the comics back in 1994, but unfortunately, she was only in six issues. Before, she was basically used as a plot device. This is where the messed up part comes in. Because Kyle Rayner comes home one day and finds her dismembered and stuffed in a fridge. Good lord. The worst part is, none of this even happened on the page. This all happened off screen. At this point, most of us are familiar with the Scarlet Witch. However, how many of us are actually familiar with the Ultimate Universe version of the character. The Ultimate Universe was created to give new readers a better entry point into comics without having to read decades of backlog. However, they used this to make things a little more edgy and not in a good way. We all knew that there was a good family relationship between Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. However, in the Ultimate Universe, it's a little more intense than that. In a discussion between Captain America and Wasp, they basically confirm they're hooking up. What in the Alabama is this? Wolverine here even catches them in the act. This is gross. Part 5. Back in the early 2000s, Marvel introduced the Ultimate Universe, where they would give new backstories and origins to different characters in their universe. That way, they made it a little easier for new readers. One of the revamped characters they brought back was Wasp. We all know Wasp from the MCU. However, the Ultimate Universe as one of the most disturbing moments in this character's history. Now I want you to remember, this is one of the founding members of the Avengers, and they end up killing her off in the Ultimate Universe. But how they do it is the messed up part. She gets eaten alive by the Blob. You know, from the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Ugh. And as you can see here, it was pretty brutal. And don't worry, because he got the absolute crap stomped out of him. Part 6. We are all familiar with the Joker, considering he's been around for 80 years at this point. But, he's done some really messed up stuff. And today, we're going to be talking about that time he cut off his own face. In the New 52 Batman run, Joker was fighting Batman, and he cut his own freaking face off and nailed it to a wall. What makes it even worse is he goes back, gets the cut-up face, and staples it back to his own body. Oh my god. And you might think, oh, that's messed up. He's wearing his own face reattached to his body. But he wasn't the only one. They also introduced a character called the Joker's Daughter, not really related, who also wears his face. Us are familiar with Batgirl, Batman's trusty sidekick, besides Robin, who's been around since 1967. However, even though this femme fatale has been one of the biggest crime fighters on Batman's side, she's no stranger to controversy. This all ties back to one of the most successful and popular one-shots in Batman history. That being, The Killing Joke. And as you can see here, this is where one of the darkest moments in Barbara Gordon's history comes into play. Joker shows up at her door as she's celebrating with her father, Commissioner Gordon, and you can see here, he, without warning, shoots her in the stomach, paralyzing her from now on. But it doesn't stop there, because after this, Joker takes a ton of inappropriate photos and makes Commissioner Gordon have to witness this. On the bright side, after all of this, Barbara Gordon became Oracle and is now Batman's guy in the chair. Part 8. This is Spider-Man's first girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, and... She caused more damage to Spider-Man than any villain ever could. After the death of her father, George Stacy, pictured here, she ended up skipping town. In fact, she skipped the country and went to Paris. While she was there, she ran into somebody who we all recognize. That would be Norman Osborn, otherwise known as the Green Goblin. They end up hooking up. It is much, much worse than that. Because not only did they kiss, they, uh, went all the way 
if you catch my drift. And how did Spider-Man find out? Oh, of course, easy. You see these two people here who just beat the crap out of Spider-Man? That's Gwen and Norman's kids. Due to the goblins' altered genetics, they grew incredibly quickly, and Norman brainwashed them into thinking that Spider-Man was their dad, and he killed their mom. Well, that last part's technically true. And the worst part is, MJ knew all along. Didn't say anything before. I can subscribe for more. I'm sure all of us out here are very familiar with Spider-Man. His most recent solo film made almost $2 billion. But did you know in 1984, Marvel, along with the National Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse, got together and made a one-shot where... We meet this smug piece of crap. His name is Skip. You will hate him. In this one shot, Skip gives a child Peter Parker some adult material. He then goes on to physically abuse Peter, if you know what I mean. And unfortunately, the child Peter Parker was too afraid to leave. This is insanely dark considering Spider-Man is one of the most popular characters for children. But unfortunately, it goes to show that not even superheroes are safe from abuse. Now I know we're all familiar with Batman and his one rule right here that you can see from Dark Knight Returns. That being not using firearms, and to a lesser extent, not taking people out, if you catch my drift. However, that wasn't always the case. Because as you can see here, in the early days, Batman encountered a vampire and shot him in his sleep. Don't worry, it gets much worse. Because in another instance, Batman encounters a mental patient right here, who he loops around the neck with a metal wire and hangs from the bat plane. By the way, this was issue number one. And the coldest part about all of this, he says it's probably better off this way. Dang, Batman. Batman's literally been breaking that rule since day one. Part 11. This is Lois Lane, Superman's girlfriend. I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with her. She's been a staple of DC Comics for decades at this point. Now, what people may think is controversial is that one issue in 1970, she turned herself black. Really? Although people may think this is controversial nowadays, Lois actually had an all right reason to do it. Lois was trying to write a story about the black experience in Metropolis, but one problem with that, no one would talk to her. So of course she went to Superman for help, and apparently he had a machine that would turn her African American for a day. Because why wouldn't he? But as you can see here, although it was only for a short time, she was able to actually get a better look into what it would be like living in someone else's shoes. Although this might be considered to be poor taste nowadays, we could all learn a lesson or two from this. This is Jubilee from the X-Men. You might recognize her from the iconic intro to the 90s X-Men cartoon. However, in 2003, one of the most messed up things in comics happened to her. During an arc in the comics called Holy War, a group of humans create the Church of Humanity, and they straight up crucify her. Good lord. But don't worry, friends. It gets even crazier. They go ahead and crucify multiple other young mutants all on the front lawn of the Xavier Institute. You know, the X-Men's headquarters. You might be asking, what was the Church of Humanity's end game here? Simple, actually. They had the only obvious end goal. Make Nightcrawler the Pope. What? Don't see how these things are correlated, but all right. Part 13. All familiar with Wolverine from the X-Men comics, cartoons, and movies. We also know that his entire skeleton is coated in adamantium, which is why he has the metal claws. But that's actually led to some horrific imagery, such as when he fought the Punisher, giving us this. Ugh. But one of the most truly terrifying moments actually came from an encounter he had with Magneto, otherwise known as the Master of Magnetism. You might be thinking to yourself, Magneto, that's kind of a silly name, until you realize he literally has control of all things metal. What else is made out of metal? Oh yeah, that's right, Wolverine's entire skeleton. Honestly, I don't know why they ever send Wolverine out against Magneto, considering this is probably going to happen like 90% of the time, if he ever remembers it. And it's truly a really messed up moment in comics. A canary. She's been in DC Comics since 1947. Traditionally, she's been with Green Arrow, Oliver Queen. However, in this issue of All-Star Batman, written by Frank Miller and drawn by Jim Lee, things take a turn. Because you see, there were a group of thugs trying to steal some bleach from a Gotham City dock. So Batman lights them on fire. Then as they're literally burning alive behind him, she makes her move. Batman and Black Canary end up hooking up on the dock while these people are still burning alive. And they want their masks on. You know, something tells me that Frank Miller really has it out for Oliver Queen. I mean, considering this and in Dark Knight Returns where he loses an arm, my man just can't catch a break. Our hearts go out to you, Ollie. This is Craven the Hunter, and you might recognize him from the upcoming movie Craven the Hunter. Or 
Craven the animal rights activist, but that's a story for another time. Craven is one of the biggest hunters in the Marvel Universe, and he's basically hunted every large sport there is. Except for now, he's after Spider-Man. And in this arc titled Craven's Last Hunt, he gets the ultimate victory. Craven beats the crap out of Spider-Man, buries him alive, he ends up taking Spider-Man's black suit, becoming Spider-Man temporarily, tracks down a cannibal that Spider-Man needed Captain America's help to fight, and solos him. Then once Peter's finally free from being buried alive, he tracks Craven down, and Craven doesn't put up a fight, because he knows he already won. With nothing else to prove and nothing else to live for, he takes himself out. Yeah, I don't think that the Craven movie's gonna end this way. In X-Men comics, we have the Phoenix Force, which is a cosmic power source that can corrupt the spirit and mind of different characters, as seen in here with Jean Grey turning into Dark Phoenix. And in the comics, the Phoenix Force ends up binding itself to Cyclops, Scott Summers. It gives him incredible power, but also slowly starts corrupting his mind. You can even see Cyclops with the power of the Phoenix here on the cover of Avengers vs. X-Men. But everything started coming to a head when Charles Xavier, Professor X himself, tried to stop Scott. Corrupted by the Phoenix Force, he ends up going against his own friend and takes out Professor X, fully becoming Dark Phoenix, which honestly is just messed up considering Professor X is basically a father figure to him. Part 17. After the comic book event Civil War, one of the most shocking and tragic deaths happened in comics. That being, the death of Captain America. After everything that went on in Civil War, he was taken out by a sniper. Or, that's what they wanted you to think. Because you see, it turns out that Marvel's version of truth, justice, and the American way was taken out by a friend. Even though Steve was actually hit by a sniper, and that sniper was actually the villain Crossbones, pictured here, or you might actually recognize him from his MCU appearance here, the person who actually dealt the final blow was Sharon Carter, or the Power Broker from the MCU. Weird title, but all right. As you can see right here, she reaches down and shoots Steve in the stomach, killing him. Which is just awful. I mean, she was technically brainwashed, so it's not really her fault, but still, she killed America. Like and subscribe for more messed up moments. Part 18. We're all familiar with the Joker and some of the most twisted things he's done, like cutting off his own face and beating a teenager like he owed him three months rent. But one of the most messed up things the Joker has done was skinning a man alive and making him do a sexy dance. What the heck is wrong with comics sometimes? Don't get me wrong, the Joker's done some crazy stuff and I don't wanna know what the heck is wrong with the people who come up with this. Like, honestly, seriously, whoever came up with this idea, seek help. Part 19. This is Talia al Ghul. In the comics, she ends up having a son with Batman. You may be familiar with him. His name is Damian Wayne. But did you know, just like Jason Todd before him, he was taken out. Yeah, Damien was actually killed by this person right here, known as the Heretic. It's actually pretty messed up when you think about it, considering Damien was the only child of Bruce. I mean, I guess you can count all of the other Robins, so I guess I should say biological child? And as you can see here, Batman is visibly distraught at the thought of losing another Robin, and this one being his only son. But what makes this even more messed up is the fact that the person who killed him was actually a clone of himself. Slightly aged up, of course, but still. This whole thing is crazy. It's even crazier the fact that he comes back with superpowers. But that's a story for another time. Part 20. If I said Captain Marvel, you'd probably think of somebody like this. Or maybe even the live action version. However, I'm actually talking about the original Captain Marvel from Marvel, not DC. That's right, before Carol Danvers, we had Marvel. And this messed up moment is actually how he died. Okay, so, you know, a superhero cosmic being, you'd think that he probably perished fighting a supervillain. No, not at all. In fact, this superpowered being passed away from cancer. Good lord. As it turns out, the original Captain Marvel, Marvel, contracted cancer from a deadly nerve gas. This is one of the most messed up moments in comics, considering it's one of the most realistic deaths that comic book characters ever had. At least he was with all of his friends and family. Part 21. In 2003, Mark Millar wrote a comic series for Marvel called Trouble, in which we get a good look at the young life of Aunt May otherwise known as May Riley. We also meet May's friend, Mary, pictured here. And the comic shows the budding relationship between these two and the Parker brothers, Ben and Richard. However, this is where things start to take a turn. Because you see, May had no problem going all the way, if you know what I mean. 
However, Mary did. So, what could be done about this? You know, since they're seeing brothers. Well, there's only one option, of course. Aunt May hooks up with both of them! Yeah, that right there is the old sweet lady we know as Aunt May. But it gets better. Aunt May gets pregnant, but Uncle Ben is sterile. Which means the baby she was pregnant with that she ended up having with Richard was Peter Parker. Part 22. We are all familiar with Thanos, the Mad Titan, from the Infinity Saga and the MCU. But we did learn a little bit more of his origins in Thanos Rising. In that arc, we meet Sui Sin, who is Thanos' mom. We also get to see Thanos as a baby and him getting born. And look at him, I mean, he's disgusting, but in a cute way. The only problem is he had the deviant gene, which means his mom wanted to kill him as soon as he was born. Dang, man. No wonder he wanted to take out half the universe. However, this is where things start to get really messed up. Because now Thanos starts to go a little nuts, as you can see here. He takes his mom, kidnaps her, ties her up, and thinks whatever made him a monster came from inside his mom. So he's going to cut her open and find out exactly what it was. Ugh. Part 23. Fans of Spider-Man may picture this when you think about Gwen Stacy. Or possibly the more modern version of the character known as Spider-Gwen. But the real legends remember that time the Green Goblin threw her off a bridge and Spider-Man caught her with his webbing at the last second. Thank goodness for spider powers, right? Well... As you can see here, he stopped her dead in her tracks, which meant all of the force went straight to her neck, killing her instantly. And just like that, Peter lost the first love of his life. But his life gets much worse, as I've covered on this channel. Let's review. The person he thought was his mom all along actually wasn't because it was Aunt May all along because she's a hoe. Before Gwen died by Norman throwing her off the bridge, the two of them actually met up in Paris and they did the deed. Then they had kids, Norman said that Spider-Man killed their mom. And we can't forget when Peter got touched by a grown man. Poor kid. Part 24. This is Mary Jane Watson, longtime girlfriend of Spider-Man. And eventually, they even ended up getting married. Which is amazing, because finally Spider-Man can get something positive in his life. Or can he? Because you see, now we get the storyline one more day. And I'm sure anybody who's familiar with the comic knows exactly why this is awful. But let me explain. Aunt May is on the brink of death, and Spider-Man makes a deal with the literal devil to bring her back. However, what does he want in return? Nah, you know, nothing too important. Just the marriage he has to Mary Jane. When they discuss this, he ends up showing their potential child that they could have had in the future if they did stay together, which is just disturbing. At the end of the day, Peter doesn't think he can go through with it. That's when MJ steps in. Mary Jane Watson made a deal with the devil to get rid of her marriage to Peter and the potential of them having children for an 89-year-old woman's life. Part 25. This is Dick Grayson, otherwise known as Nightwing, or Batman's first Robin, and this is the story of the most messed up thing he's ever done. In the comics, Nightwing and Batgirl have always been a little close, but this takes it to a whole new level. Because you see, they end up hooking up. There's a problem though. The morning after Dick and Barbara Gordon hook up, he ends up giving her a letter, which is an invitation to his wedding the next day to Starfire. What is wrong with him? Yeah, the day before his wedding to an intergalactic space princess, he hooks up with a girl who he basically grew up with, who was handicapped by his worst nemesis. Good show, Dick. Living up to that name. Thanks to this user on my TikTok for giving me the idea for this short. Have a great day. Part 26. Batman is by far one of the most popular superheroes of all time, but he absolutely has a checkered past. We already covered the time he hung a mentally handicapped man from a plane, and even the time he hooked up with Black Canary, Green Arrow's girlfriend, while people were burning alive behind him. But honestly, this one might be the most disturbing. In this issue, he was fighting KG Beast, who you may recognize from DC's Harley Quinn cartoon, or even this very small scene from Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. In typical Batman fashion, the two fight for a while before making their way into a sewer at which point they go into a supply closet where Batman makes his move. Batman traps him in the room and basically boards up the door, leaving him no way to escape, so he basically starves to death. Dang, Batman. Why you got to do him so dirty? Part 27. We are all familiar with Captain America from his many appearances in the MCU, but today we're going to be talking about the time that he broke bad. This is one of the most messed up moments in Captain America's history because he's basically joining the bad guys from WW2, if you know what I mean. 
And unfortunately, it's a massive betrayal of the character, and it made comic book fans justifiably angry. Captain America has always been a symbol, basically, of eternal optimism and the American dream. Think of it as Marvel's version of Superman, meaning Marvel's embodiment of truth, justice, and the American way. But the reason that it was so messed up that Cap switched sides and joined Hydra was the origin of the character, and who created him in the first place. He was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby doing the artwork. And Captain America has always fought the forces of Hydra, like in issue number one, where you see Captain America punching a certain mustachio German in the face. And this heel turns really messed up because the creators of Cap were both Jewish. Part 28. We're all familiar with Selena Kyle as Catwoman. However, she has a sister named Maggie Kyle. And unfortunately in this story, she has a fateful run-in with Black Mask. For those of you who don't know, Black Mask is a supervillain who doesn't really have any powers, besides the one that Batman has, which is money, but he does like to torture people. And unfortunately for Maggie Kyle and her husband, Black Mask puts his sights on them. Black Mask not only beats and tortures them both, but he decides to cut pieces of her husband off and force her to eat them, including his eyes. Although this is very messed up and completely disturbing, Selina does indeed get her revenge at the end of the story. So I guess, silver lining? I don't know how much of a silver lining it is considering this is still an insanely dark and disturbing comic. Shout out to this user on my TikTok for giving me the idea. Recently in the series, I covered the moment that Dick Grayson broke Barbara Gordon's heart. However, she did it first. Because you see, while Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon were dating in Batman Beyond 2.0, she hooked up with Bruce. And she got pregnant. And as you can see in this panel right here, it's not Dick's, because he was only back for three weeks. And she was seven weeks pregnant. Therefore, it's Batman's. Surprise. Dick Grayson is justifiably angry about this, so he beats the crap out of Batman. However, while that's going on, Barbara takes down a thug in the streets and has a miscarriage. That is seriously a messed up moment in comics. I'm sure we're all familiar with Green Lantern of Sector 2814, otherwise known as Hal Jordan. But were you familiar with his half-elf girlfriend, Aresia? The two had a pretty intense relationship, to say the least. But why? Well, first off, she was another Green Lantern, just like he was. And at one point, she was even his protege. You can even see here where he welcomes her into the Green Lantern Corps and refers to her as Little Sister. All right. But that line, Little Sister, actually has a lot more meaning than you'd think. Because you see, at first, she liked Hal, but he couldn't get with her because she was a bit too young. In fact, she was 13 years old. They get around this by making the ring turn her into a more appropriate age, physically, but not necessarily mentally. Mr. Jordan, there's someone I'd like you to meet. This is Sue Dibney, wife of the Elongated Man. And this is by far one of the most messed up comics in DC history. Because today we're covering how she died in Identity Crisis. Every year for his birthday, Sue would make the Elongated Man a little surprise. And this year, it was that she was pregnant. But he only finds this out after he finds her charred body. But hold on a minute, friends, because it gets much, much worse from here. Because at her funeral, we learn that Dr. Light, famed villain of the Justice League and Teen Titans, broke into the JLA headquarters while she was alone and assaulted her brutally. Then it took most of the JLA to hold him back afterwards so Zatanna could go ahead and wipe his mind, making it so he never remembers that this ever happened. Except Batman had some reservations about this, so she wiped his mind also. Good lord. I recently made a YouTube short going over a brief description of Mark Miller's Trouble from 2003. Little did I know how truly messed up this story would get. So let's just have a quick recap. This is Aunt May. Yes, this same Aunt May. And for some reason she looks exactly like MJ, which makes it even worse that she uses the same face at Tiger you hit the jackpot line. Moving on. She's a huge hoe, hooking up with both Uncle Ben and Peter Parker's dad, Richard Parker. Because her friend Mary, pictured here, wouldn't do it with Richard Parker because she was afraid she'd become a mom because of what a fortune teller told her. Okay? Aunt May gets pregnant with Richard Parker's baby, meaning that that baby is in fact Peter Parker, and they did it 47 times. Jesus Christ. Oh, and don't worry, there's a scene where she's debating aborting the baby. So that's fun. She ends up giving Peter to Mary, and Mary raises her with Richard. So happy ending, I guess? <laughs> this is a character in DC Comics known as Tarantula. She was created in 2002 and is morally ambiguous, to say the least. And you'll see why. One fateful night, she was working with Dick Grayson, otherwise known as Nightwing. 
They end up getting ambushed by a character named Blockbuster, and that's where the messed up part starts. Because while they were all fighting, Tarantula shoots Blockbuster, killing him, which makes Dick Grayson have a panic attack. He ends up going to the roof, claiming he can't breathe from his anxiety. And that's when she makes her move. Nightwing is literally saying, don't touch me. And she decides to take control, if you know what I mean. Good lord. So many things wrong with this. One, if the roles were reversed, there would be riots. Two, she just killed a guy. And three, what is up with guys in the Bat family getting attacked without their consent? If you know what I mean, that's how Damien was made too. We are all familiar with Mary Jane Watson. And this is the story of how she died. Now, she didn't have a traditional death like some Spider-Man characters. She wasn't thrown off a bridge and killed by the sudden stop like Gwen. She wasn't shot like Aunt May or Uncle Ben. But as we learned in Spider-Man Reign, her fate was much, much worse. In that comic, we learned that MJ died of cancer. But exactly how did she get it? Actually, it's quite simple. Spider-Man's radioactive spider goo, if you know what I mean. No joke, as you see right here, he said that he was poisoning her with his radioactive bits. Obviously, this isn't canon, but seriously, chalk up another point on the Peter Parker gets screwed over by writer's board. I mean, between this, Aunt May secretly being his mom and a huge hoe, him accidentally killing his girlfriend, and being assaulted as a child, he really cannot catch a break. In the Ultimates issue number five, Bruce Banner injects himself with the Super Soldier Serum, which, unfortunately, has some side effects. It still turns him into the Hulk, but it makes him stronger, angrier, and more randy, if you catch my drift. This is not going to be good. The plot of this comic is Hulk is on his way tracking down Betty, his ex-girlfriend, who is actually on a date with Fred Jones himself, Freddy Prinze Jr., of all people. Anyway, Nick Fury sends a team of elite superheroes to take out the Hulk. And this is where the messed up parts start. He takes out Giant Man and threatens to decapitate him and use his head as a toilet bowl. Tony Stark tries to take him out, but that does absolutely nothing. And that's where the Wasp comes in. In a genius move, she flashes the Hulk to try to distract him. That doesn't work either. Somehow Thor's hammer only makes him more in the mood. Until finally the fight's over and Cap kicks him in the face. In 2019, we get the Batman arc known as City of Bane in which we get one of the most messed up stories that ever happened to the Bat family. Because in this comic, we see Thomas Wayne Batman from Flashpoint team up with Bane. He does this in order to psychologically break Bruce Wayne and give up on the role of Batman so he could just retire and be with Catwoman. And how does he go about doing this? Quite simple, actually. Obvious first step, capture your grandson. Step two, have the hired muscle break his surrogate grandfather's neck. Step three, shoot your son in the gut while he's wrestling Bane. Of course, step four being shoot Bane in the face. And the most important step of all, I cannot stress this enough. Have Bane survive getting shot in the face and have him snap your back in prison. This is Detective Comics number 613 from 1990. In this comic, we meet a child named Mike Dell and his father, who's a humble trash collector. Mike is working on a project for school about saving the environment, and his father, being a trash collector, decides to take him to the local landfill. But before they get there, they have a run-in with some unsavory characters. And by the time they do end up at the landfill, the villains are already there, and they decide to attack. And unfortunately, this is where the first twist of the story comes in. You see, Mike was hiding out in the garbage truck, and he was shot and killed by one of the villains. And as you can see, Batman was just a little late getting there. But you see, this is where the story gets absolutely nuts. As Batman starts beating the crap out of all of the thugs there, he quickly dodges the bullets of one of the thugs. But as that's happening, he trips. And two evildoers fell into a trash compactor and got crushed to death. All of this while Mike's father holds his lifeless body. Good lord. This is Jewel from Marvel Comics, otherwise known as Jessica Jones. And if you know anything about the character, you know what's in store. One day she was flying through the streets of New York and heard some commotion, so she went to investigate. That was a big mistake. Because that was her first encounter with the Purple Man, otherwise known as Kilgrave, from Marvel Comics. Now this character has an interesting power set. That being, he emits pheromones, which basically compels you to do whatever he says, no matter how depraved. And when she begins to confront him about this situation, he compels her to begin undressing in public. This is just the beginning. Because you see, after this, he compels her to stay with him and basically traffics her. But after enough time, she's able to finally break free from his curse and start her own detective agency, becoming the Jessica Jones we know now. 
All before she meets up with Luke Cage and does something in a very uncomfortable place. I like the back of a Volkswagen. Recently in this series, we've covered how Marvel really, really hates Spider-Man. And today is no exception. In fact, it's probably one of the worst things that's happened. At least, according to fans. In a recent run of Spider-Man, Peter and MJ get stuck in an alternate reality. They're saved at the nick of time by this guy named Paul. You'll see why fans hate him. Because through the power of comics, Peter makes a device that sends him back to his normal dimension. And unfortunately, he's the only one to go. But then we find out time flows at a different rate from their home dimension. And while Peter's gone, MJ ends up forming an entire relationship with Paul. Completely abandoning any hope that Peter would come back. Seriously, they even have adopted kids together. Oh, and they both get absolutely shredded. Oh yeah, and apparently Paul straight up punches Peter in the face at one point, but don't worry, it's completely justified apparently. But don't worry, friends, the kids get erased from existence, and it looks like Peter snapped and is doing a reverse Gwen Stacy. Good for him. In 2009, we got the return of Marvel Zombies. And in this issue, Galactus was turned and the people who ate his flesh gained his powers. One of the zombies, Spider-Man, ends up going to a non-zombified universe. And terrible things happen. The Sinister Six attack, and before the normal non-zombified Spider-Man can intervene, Zombie Spider-Man makes his move. To the horror of the other members, he takes out Kraven, rips out Mysterio's brain, and eventually takes out the rest of the Sinister Six. Except for Sandman. He runs away. Absolutely terrified as to what he just saw, Sandman tries to make a break for it. And that's when he runs into the normal Spider-Man. Spider-Man tries to plead his case, but Sandman's not having it, and starts beating the crap out of him. Before forcibly going down Spider-Man's throat, filling him up like a balloon, and popping him. Good lord. Why do the writers hate Spider-Man so much? Recently, I made a YouTube short talking all about Paul and MJ's relationship. However, there was something I left out, and it involves Peter. At one point, Peter's talking with Felicia Hardy, the black cat, and that's when he drops the line. Peter straight up says that he thinks of MJ more like a sister. Excuse me? Oh, hold on there, friends. I just want to make sure we're talking about the same Peter and MJ. So Peter thinks of this as sisterly behavior, and he obviously thinks this is okay for siblings to do as well. Are you completely sure about that? Just to really hammer this home, he married somebody who he thinks of as a sister? Hmm. This is Talia al Ghul, otherwise known as the Daughter of the Demon. She and Batman have a complicated relationship, to say the least. But why? You may think it's because her dad is Ra's al Ghul, leader of the League of Assassins, and basically the person who trained Batman in some iteration. Or maybe it's because they had a physical relationship and now he's with Catwoman. Well, it's a little bit closer to the truth. In reality, the real problem comes from the fact that she drugged Batman and had her way with him, resulting in the birth of their son, who Batman honestly didn't know about, but you may recognize him as the DCU's newest Robin, Damian Wayne. Yeah. That's right. It was non-consensual on Batman's part. And just like I said with the assault of Nightwing before him, if the roles were reversed, there would be riots. This is Batman issue number 686, and in this issue, we discover how Bruce Wayne died. While having a near-death experience, Batman gets to witness his own funeral, where he sees friends and foes. And that's where we learn the shocking truth. After the death of his parents, Bruce became Batman. Unfortunately, though, he wasn't really a good crime fighter. So, Alfred being the father figure to Bruce that he was, decided to take measures into his own hands. And how would he do this? He fabricated supervillain stories and had actors play the most famous Batman villains we know today. But Batman needed a true nemesis, and who better to play him than Alfred himself. In this comic, Alfred was the Joker. Bruce eventually finds out about this, and Alfred tries to stop him from fighting the Riddler. Unfortunately, Bruce doesn't listen to Alfred and goes to confront him, where he gets shot point-blank, leading to the funeral at the beginning of the issue. In 1984, we got the mini-arc known as the Judas Contract, and anyone familiar with Teen Titans knows that this is going to be a doozy. The Teen Titans member Terra is one of the key members of this story, along with Blade Wilson himself, Deathstroke. And this is where the messed up part starts. Because you see, it was revealed that Terra was a double agent working with Slade the entire time. And you might be thinking to yourself, that's not that bad. But it gets worse. Because you see, they weren't just partners in crime. They were partners in life. Yeah, that's right. He's a supervillain in every sense of the word. Don't worry, friends, it gets much better. Because he ends up killing his superhero son, and Terra dies in the process as well. Has this all been retconned at some point? Probably, but it still doesn't change the fact that Deathstroke was with an underage girl. 
Chris Hansen's been notified. But hey, this arc gave us Nightwing. So that's fun. We are all familiar with Thanos, the Mad Titan, obsessed with death, wanting to wipe out half the universe. But what about the time he did something good? This is the time Thanos helped an old woman cross the street. You might be thinking to yourself, Alex, this isn't messed up. Let me explain. Thanos purposely halted traffic to help this woman cross the street because there was a passenger on board, this young girl. And at first this doesn't seem significant until a little later on in her life because Thanos goes to visit her on her deathbed, and that's when he drops the bomb. By helping the old woman across the road that day, he stopped the flow of traffic. The young girl, Stephanie Critcher, wouldn't meet somebody who was very impactful to her life, which would have set her down a path of curing all diseases, world hunger, and inequality. He tells her by doing this, he basically made her waste her life. Then she dies. Shout out for the suggestion. Messed up moments in comics that made us go. Hey yo, what the fuck? Part 46. This is the superior Spider-Man, and although he may look like Peter Parker, there is a deep dark secret there. In Spider-Man issue number 700, it was revealed that Peter Parker and Dr. Otto Octavius switched bodies. After Doc Ock gained control of Peter's body, he ended up encountering Scorpion. During the fight, superior Spider-Man ended up knocking Scorpion's jaw clean off, making Doc Ock realize, oh my god, he's been holding back all along. But the really messed up part, is the fact that Doc Ock's body that Peter's mind is now trapped in was dying. During Peter's final moments, their consciousness starts to melt, and Otto gets to live all of Peter's memories, but with Otto in there in his place. With all of this happening, Otto is able to tell Peter, in Otto's old body, that he understands with great power comes great responsibility. And with that, the Peter that we knew was gone. This is all-star Batman and Robin, and you may be asking yourself, why is Batman yellow? There's a simple answer, actually. Originally, one of Green Lantern's main weaknesses was the color yellow. So when Batman had to face off against Hal Jordan, he decided to take that to the extreme. Bruce skirted child labor laws and made Robin paint not only himself, Batman, but the entire set the color yellow. This would render Hal Jordan's ring completely useless. And that's when Robin decided to snap. Robin leapt into action, punching Hal Jordan in the throat, crushing his windpipe, making it so he couldn't breathe. Thankfully, Bruce was there and he stepped into action by throwing Robin against a wall, beating the crap out of him for a second, and performed an emergency tracheotomy, that way saving Hal's life. After doing so, he even dropped this line. Congratulations, kid. You're not a murderer. Good lord. In Thanos Annual Number 1, we track the Mad Titan in his quest to destroy someone's life. The story opens up with Cosmic Ghost Rider. He's telling us the story about how Thanos decides to torture a young baby named David. He decides to visit him once a year on his birthday, and things start off small. On his first birthday, you can see Thanos steals his blanket, causing the baby to cry through the night. However, things quickly escalate, as on his fifth birthday, he causes a car accident with his father still in the car. On David's 16th birthday, Thanos makes him break up with his girlfriend. On his 21st, he doesn't let David have a drink. On his 25th, he burns down his grad school. On his 27th, he makes him get fired from his job, and kills his cat. This all changes on his 30th birthday, where he thinks he's finally free because the Avengers exiled him from the planet. However, Thanos returns the following year and sucks his entire neighborhood into a black hole. Finally, on his 45th birthday, he confronts Thanos, stating that all of this must be a test to see if David will take his own life. But really, Thanos doesn't even care. Messed Up Moments in Comics, Part 49. I'm sure we're all familiar with the Ultimate Spider-Man, but Peter wasn't always himself. In between issues 66 and 67 of Ultimate Spider-Man, Peter actually switches places with the man himself, Wolverine. And it's a lot creepier than you'd think. So Logan wouldn't stop hitting on Jean Grey, so she did the logical step, what anyone would do, and sent his brain to Spider-Man's body. She didn't intentionally send him to Spider-Man's body, it was just the place that he would least want to go. And Wolverine does what every 200-year-old man trapped in a 15-year-old's body would do, and tries to hook up with his girlfriend. I mean, for the love of God, just look at that face. That should tell you everything you need to know. Thankfully, Jean switches them back, and Spider-Man rightfully is pissed, as you can tell by his copious amounts of cursing. And he does meet back up with MJ and says that he's sorry that he wasn't himself, which, I mean, is accurate. She dropped the bomb that they did try to hook up. This whole story made us all go, Hey yo, what the f Messed up moments in comics part 50. This is the DC Comics character, Big Barda, and this is her fateful encounter with Superman. In this issue of Action Comics, both Superman and Big Barda were under the control of a character named Sleaze. As you can see right there is Mr. Miracle, Big Barda's husband. 
While they're both being mind controlled by Sleaze, let's just say that he makes them do an adult film. Yeah, seriously, he mind controls both Superman and Big Barda, introduces them to a director of adult material, and proceeds to film the entire thing. While Mr. Miracle tries to track them down and free them from the control. Mr. Miracle is able to break in and stop it before it goes too far. But the problem is, we really don't know how far it went. And unfortunately, neither do they. But we do get this amazing shot of Mr. Miracle's face. I mean, look at the pure hatred he has for both of them in this moment. And eventually, they all go their separate ways and decide never to talk about this again. This is Kara Zor-El, or as you might know her, Supergirl. And she needs to stay far, far away from Hal Jordan. Because in 2007, we got The Brave and the Bold, issue number two, and we got this page. Now, at first, it seems pretty innocuous. Nothing too out of the ordinary here, just two superheroes flying through space. That is until you look a little closer. She tries to open up to Hal and get a little bit closer to him, build a little more of a connection, and be more personable. And that's when Hal says this. You have food in the refrigerator older than her. No bad thoughts. She's 17. Then she puts her arm around him and says, what do you like to do for fun when the mask comes off? Realistically, she's probably just asking if he has any time to cut loose. But he again reminds himself, she's 17. Honestly makes me think, in brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape his sight. Part 52. This is Power Girl, otherwise known as Supergirl from Earth 2, Kara Zor-El. Though similar to Earth-1, she's a little older, but that's besides the point. And this is the story of the time that she inexplicably had a child. Let's get into it. This all takes place during 1994 Zero Hour, which, if you don't know, was the second time DC tried to consolidate their universes. They also tried to use this comic to kill off Wally West, but that's a story for another time. In the comic, we see a pregnant Power Girl interacting with her Earth-1 counterpart. And you can see during all the commotion, she goes into labor. And her unborn child is able to protect her with a force field. That must be important, right? While the multiverse is collapsing, Wonder Woman helps deliver the baby. And at the end of the day, you can see Power Girl standing there with her newborn child. So you might be asking yourself, Alex, what's the messed up part? It's quite simple, actually. They never mention the child again, the child has no father, and there's no explanation as to what happened. Part 53. This is the governor from The Walking Dead, and he honestly might be one of the most messed up characters in comics. You might be thinking to yourself, what has he done that's so bad? Let me explain. Well, for starters, he cuts off the hand of Rick, the main character from the comic. Okay, dismemberment. Nothing new. Couldn't be that bad, right? There's also the fact that he assaults Michonne. And while he does, he makes sure that Glenn's in the cell next to them, hearing everything. And yes, you heard that right. I'm talking about the same katana-wielding Michonne that we all know. But by far the most messed up thing that this character has done is rip out the teeth of his zombie daughter before making out with her. Then vomiting, saying he's going to need to get used to the taste. Who hurt you, Robert Kirkman? Who hurt you? Part 54. This is the Batman Who Laughs, a twisted version of Bruce Wayne. And this is the story of his defeat of the Justice League. In this comic, Superman responds to a call from Batman, saying he needs his help on the Watchtower. But things aren't right, because when Superman gets there, basically the entire Justice League is gone. Clark can also barely breathe and starts bleeding from the eyes as it turns out the air has been tainted with kryptonite. Things take an even darker turn when it turns out that Lois and their son, Jonathan, were both there. As you can see, the kryptonite is also affecting their son. And this is where the Batman who laughs pulls out all the stops because you can see he brings black kryptonite, which turns Kryptonians into homicidal rage monsters. And you can see here, Batman says he tested this on Superman's cousin, Supergirl, Kara Zor-El, where she ripped her family apart. After saying this, Bruce casually throws the black kryptonite at the boys, causing them to take out Lois. This is why Batman is the most dangerous hero. In Invincible issue 110, we witness the interaction between Mark and Anissa. This has been one of my most requested episodes from you guys, and I understand why. Earlier in the issue, we learn that Mark's wife has left him, which obviously is devastating, but it gets even worse. Anissa start coming to blows after she says that they are tasked to rebuild their empire. In typical Robert Kirkman fashion, the fight is brutal. But it's what happens during the fight that's the messed up part. Because as this is going on, she starts to assault him. And he says he doesn't want it and to leave her alone. She then removes his clothing and... I really can't say the rest on YouTube. But after the assault is finished, she tells him to man up. And he sits there, on the verge of tears. Why, Robert Kirkman? Why? <laughs> Mm 
messed up moments in comics that made us go, What the f is that? Part 56. We're all familiar with Supergirl, but her love life can't be that messed up. Or can it? Because you see, friends, the 60s were a wild time, and in this issue, we're going to be going over the time she fell in love with a horse. Yes, you heard that right. But let me explain. This is Comet the Super Horse, but he wasn't always this way. In fact, he actually used to be a centaur. And after saving a sorceress, she made a potion to turn him into a human, but also wanted to turn him into a horse, and she mixed them up. Supergirl ended up having dreams of this horse, and eventually, they ended up meeting each other. Hilariously, he also has the powers of telepathy and immortality. And they share a connection because they had a psychic link when he was trapped on a comet and she was flying to Earth in her space pod. Whenever a comet flies over Earth, he changes back into a human. And that's when the two of them form a relationship. But it gets worse. He doesn't only just form a relationship with Supergirl. At one point, this horse also hooks up with Lois Lane and eventually becomes an angel. Messed up moments in comics that made us go... What the f***? Part 57. Yesterday, in honor of the holidays, I covered all the times that Spider-Man had something good happen in his life. However, if Spider-Man fans are happy, the writers decide... They've had it too good for too long. So in today's video, we're going to be going over all of the terrible things that have happened to our boy, Peter Parker. For starters, Aunt May is secretly his mom. And yes, I know I said Aunt May. She ends up getting with Uncle Ben later down the road, but had the baby with Richard Parker. As a child, he was assaulted by a full-grown man. He's chronically bullied through school. He's technically responsible for his girlfriend losing her life. The same girlfriend who, in a retcon story, hooked up with Norman Osborn before she perished. When Body Swapped Wolverine tried to hook up with his girlfriend. The same girlfriend who leaves him for another guy in a different dimension. Who also made a deal with the devil to get rid of their marriage. All after miscarrying her and Peter's baby. All before Doc Ock swaps bodies with him and he passes away. Honestly, no one hates Spider-Man more than the writers. This is Batman The Widening Gyre, written by Kevin Smith. Yes, you heard me right. Silent Bob himself. Kevin Smith writing the comic book was not the problem. However, it's what happens in the story itself. You might be thinking, there's been some really messed up stuff in DC Comics before. This couldn't be that bad, right? Let's do a little digging and find out exactly why this story is so controversial to fans. We get this panel here, which is a beautiful representation of Batman's first night on the job, illustrated by Walt Flanagan from Comic Book Men. Or as you may know him, the guy who says tell him Steve Dave on all of the View Askew movies. However, the real problem is the panel below this. Because as you can see here, Batman said that he wet his pants from a bladder spasm on his first night on the prowl. What the f He is vengeance. He is the knight. He needs new pants! Part 59. This is Lex Luthor, one of the most iconic villains from Superman's rogues gallery. But did you know, he had a sister. And he did arguably one of the most messed up things to her. Let's talk about it. This is Lena Luthor. But you might recognize her from her appearance on the CW show Supergirl. But in the comics, in this particular issue, she was wheelchair bound. And Lex Luthor and Superboy teamed up to help cure her. As you can see here, Lex Luthor injects her with a cure, which causes her to be able to stand once again. You can even see tears streaming down her face. You might be thinking, where's the messed up part? Well, Lex immediately injects her with a reversing agent, which causes her to fall back into the wheelchair in a near vegetative state. After which Superboy throws the man and smashes him into a wall, stating that Lex giveth and taketh away. He just wanted to prove that he could cure her if he wanted. Part 60. This is Roy Harper, otherwise known as Speedy. You may recognize him from Teen Titans, or possibly Young Justice. And in today's episode, we're going to go over his battle with addiction. This story is called Snowbirds Don't Fly, written by Denny O'Neill and drawn by Neil Adams. This part of the story has Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, finding Roy using illicit substances. Justifiably angry, Ollie slaps him like he owed him three months' rent. And after some verbal sparring, Roy leaves. Hal Jordan comes in and helps take Roy to Black Canary's house, where he starts suffering some pretty violent side effects. As that's going on, one of Roy's friends breaks into his house now that it's empty, ODs, and passes away. And at that friend's funeral, Ollie and Roy reconnect, where Roy straight up punches him in the face. And at that moment, Roy decides that he's done with Ollie and leaves for good. Going out on his own, leaving Green Arrow solo. This is Mera, Queen of Atlantis, wife of Aquaman, mother of Aqua Baby. Or as you might know her, she who shall not be named. You may be asking yourself, who is Aqua Baby? Let me explain. Back in the day, Mera and Aquaman had a child named 
Arthur Jr. He was captured by Black Manta and subsequently suffocated in air. Suffocating in air, I get it, weird thing to think about, but let's keep going. You'd think the death of their son would hit both of them pretty hard. Or would it? Because you see, we're going back to that old chestnut, Blackest Night, in which Black Lantern Aquaman gives their zombified son back to Mera. Which, here's the messed up part, she turns into a red lantern and incinerates it. At which point Atrocitus, basically the embodiment of rage, says he has nothing left to say but welcome to the core. It's bad enough that you lose a kid once, but twice? And once by your own hand. It's no secret that typically Gwen Stacy's fate is pretty awful, but the ultimate universe is a bit of a different story. You see, because this is carnage. And unlike other versions, this is a genetic modification of Venom and Peter's DNA. And in this issue of Ultimate Spider-Man, it tracks down Gwen. Petrified by fear, she's unable to move as it slowly moves in and starts wrapping its tendrils around her. Once Carnage grabs Gwen, Carnage begins to feed, but not in a traditional way. This version of Carnage sucks the life force out of its victims. And in this case, it does it while creating a face on its face. You can see that Gwen starts withering away right in place, while staring into the eyes of what almost looks like Peter, until she's completely drained and there's no life left in her body. Hey yo, what the fuck? But I guess it's fine because at the end of the day, I guess Carnage kind of replaces Gwen. Part 63. This is the DC Comics character, Dog Welder. And as his name suggests, he welds dogs to things. There's something deeply psychologically wrong with that and whoever created this character. But anyway, you may think this is just a deranged man who has a fixation on welding unalived dogs to things. But it's much, much, much weirder. This man is crap talk Spectre to his face, who by all accounts has the powers of God. But the most messed up part is the fact that Dog Welder is a mantle passed from generation to generation. And the first victim that ever fell prey to the Dog Welder was none other than the Egyptian god Anubis. What the f In 2003, Doctor Doom got this mystical armor. But the question is, how did he get it? Well, it actually involves his girlfriend, Valeria. You know, the same Valeria that Reed and Sue Storm named their daughter after at Doom's behest. And although this story takes place in 03, the character debuted in 1969. So how do you get the armor? Well, in typical Doctor Doom fashion, he made a deal with some nether demons. But in order to get the armor, he had to give up something that could never be replaced. And that was the only woman he ever loved. And honestly, this is truly grotesque. You can see the flesh being ripped away from her bones. And actually, it's her body that gets ripped away, turned into leather, and made into the armor. So when he's talking to her skeleton saying, I will always hold you close to me, he's being literal. And honestly, the audacity of him doing this to the woman he loved and then forcing his arch nemesis to name their daughter after this girl really just makes you go, hey yo, what the? Part 65. This is Dr. Kurt Connors, otherwise known as the Lizard. And in today's video, we're going to be going over the day that Kurt Connors died. This takes place in issue number 631 of The Amazing Spider-Man. In the book, we see Peter getting the best of the lizard in typical Spidey fashion. But in reality, Peter has absolutely nothing to do with the ending of Kurt Connors. In fact, it's actually these two pictured here. They're the children of Craven the Hunter. It all starts with Craven's daughter, Anna, kidnapping Billy Connors, Kurt's son, leaving him tied up and unable to escape while the lizard starts creeping in. And so you're aware the blue text box is the subconscious brain of Kurt Connors while the green is obviously the lizard. Kurt's subconscious is screaming, trying to get to the front to stop what the lizard's about to do. And Billy is saying, please, daddy, don't do this. You can see the lizard bites into Billy. He even says he always knew that Kurt would take him out. As Billy passes, you can see Kurt's consciousness fade away. Part 66. This is Bruce Wayne Batman, and he's currently sitting on the Mobius chair. But this isn't just an ordinary throne. In fact, it gives whoever sits down in the chair basically all of the knowledge in the universe. Well, let's be honest here, when Batman sits in it, he's kind of a prick. When he finally asks it the question we've all been waiting for, who is the Joker, he's left stunned. Because you see, friends, for all these years, there hasn't just been one Joker, there have been three. What the f Yes, this is true. They're each different people, and they each represent basically a different era in Batman. So you might be thinking, how does the storyline handle this startling revelation? Well, Jason Todd thinks he's being set up to be the next Joker, so he takes one of them out. Then the second Joker completely snaps and takes out the original in front of Batman, making it so that, surprise, surprise, at the end of the day, we're back to the status quo. 
part 67. This is Shadowcat from the X-Men, or as you may know her, Kitty Pride. And today we're going to be going over one of the most messed up things that happened to this character. This story takes place in Wolverine and the X-Men issue number 5, and we'll jump in here with Beast, looking like a lion for some reason, trying to find Kitty Pride. After trying to find her with absolutely no luck, he goes to her dorm, where we see her trying to reach out to Colossus, who at the time she was dating, but hanging up when he answers. When Beast finally gets her to open the door, it's revealed she's pregnant. Or is she? Because only two days before, she wasn't pregnant, and Beast confirms she's actually infected with an alien race of bugs known as the Brood, which are a race of hive mind bug-like aliens which normally, when they're infected, take over their host turning them into more of these bugs. So the fact that she hasn't been changed, and in fact has a ton of them living inside her, is just messed up, man. This is the Right Red Hand, a team of civilians in Marvel who have lost family members to the actions of Wolverine. And honestly, everything to do with this story is insane. For instance, one of the people on their side to enact justice against Wolverine is his own son, Dakin. Okay, but that's not too bad, so how could it be worse? How about infusing a demon's soul in Wolverine's body? Trying to turn him into the Helverine. Okay, what about when that doesn't work out? They find all of the living children that Wolverine's had throughout the years and have them join the team, where he then unknowingly takes all of them out. Then once all of his children are gone, they reveal the truth that he was the one responsible for ending them. But it's not like he can get revenge because they all drank the Kool-Aid. Then while they're all in the fiery place below, they reunite with their family members that Wolverine took out. Except for this kid known as the Sun because his mom is a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, who Wolverine accidentally took out, meaning that kid's self-deleted for no reason. Part 69. Nice. Nice. Nice! We're familiar with Billy Butcher and the gang from The Boys on Amazon Prime Video, but did you know the comics are much, much darker? For instance, remember at the beginning of the show when Starlight and the Deep shared a moment? Well, in the comics, it was actually Homelander. And A-Train and Black Noir. And did you know in the comics Maeve legitimately cared about Homelander? That was until Homelander and Black Noir pulled the old switcheroo, if you know what I mean. Speaking of Black Noir, he's a completely different character from the show. In fact, in the comics, late in the run, it's revealed, spoiler alert I guess, but you know, it's different from the show, it's an evil clone of Homelander. Yeah, I said evil. Even more messed up than the one we know. He did horrific acts that were too depraved for even the Homelander in the comics. And framed Homelander for him, including, as you can see, eating babies, and even more messed up moments that I couldn't fit in this video. Part 70. This is Mistress Death, effectively the Grim Reaper of Marvel, and I'm sure we're all aware of the jolly purple giant that's madly in love with her. That being the Mad Titan himself, Thanos. But what if I told you she was in love with someone else? Let me explain. Although Thanos tried to wipe out half of life in the universe for Mistress Death, her heart belonged to Deadpool. But do you really think the pettiest man in the multiverse would allow this to happen? No. No, he wouldn't. Basically, everything Thanos has ever done was to try to court death. But the Merc with the Mouth came by it easily. In fact, he barely really had to do anything. And the two of them actually started to develop a relationship. Considering Deadpool has an incredible healing factor, so every time he was on the brink of death, they'd have a chance to connect. Well, until Thanos stepped in. Thanos being the jealous, petty grimace that he is, cursed Deadpool with immortality making sure that Deadpool would never truly be able to be with Mistress Death. Part 71. This is Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, and it absolutely lives up to the title. But let me explain. Deadpool usually has a couple voices in his head, but in this story, it's replaced by just the one. And unfortunately, it has one motivation. Take out everyone in the Marvel Universe. And he absolutely follows through. He takes out Owatu the Watcher with ease, squashes Spider-Man like the bug he is, steals Hank Pym's technology, and simultaneously nukes the Avengers, leaving only a few of them left, which he easily takes out like Thor, using Hank Pym's technology to make Mjolnir enormous and crush him, until Hulk finally puts a stop to his rampage. Until he turns to Bruce Banner in his sleep and Deadpool takes him out. He then systematically takes out the X-Men, fights Wolverine while wearing Beast's pelt. He gets the Punisher, before moving on to cosmic beings like Thanos and Silver Surfer, uses Man-Thing to take out Taskmaster, before going in the real world and taking out the writers. This is Mystique from Marvel Comics. You might recognize her from her appearance in the X-Men movies. But did you know that she's actually a mom to one of the X-Men members? Or, I guess, technically a dad now. Let's talk about it. In the old canon, it was established that Mystique was the mother of Nightcrawler, who she had with this character, Azazel, who you might recognize from X-Men First Class. But just recently, she was talking with the uncanny Spider-Man, who, big surprise, 
They somehow roped in Spider-Man, but don't worry, it's actually Nightcrawler. And she told him the entire story that we all thought was his real origin was a lie. As it turns out, Mystique was in a relationship with another woman. Which isn't the problem here. You'll see what I mean. Mystique pulls the Jada Pinkett Smith and calls her relationship with Azazel an entanglement. After breaking it off, she impregnates her girlfriend. And before it was established, Mystique was the one who gave birth, but not anymore. Where's this guy reaching? Part 73. This is the Lord of Apocalypse, seeker of the anti-life equation, Darkseid. And this is the story of the one person who's able to beat him once a year incredibly powerful villain. He can solo the new gods, can basically take out the Justice League on his own, and is quite possibly one of the most famous big bads that DC has. So you might be thinking to yourself, who could beat him? In this two-page story, we see one of Darkseid's underlings bringing news. He states he has gotten past all of our defenses. Another underling states that the satellites have been disabled and the flying parademons are helpless. Grounded air forces are ineffective to this threat. Then they say he's here. Darkseid asks, on the planet? And the thug says, no, he's in the room. That's when we see the threat that Darkseid faces every year. It's none other than Santa Claus. Every year, Santa hand delivers a lump of coal to Darkseid and escapes without a scratch. Part 74. This is a one-shot known as Darkhold Spider-Man, and it might be one of the most messed up versions of the character, but why? In this comic, New York is crumbling, and the only thing keeping it together is Spider-Man's webs. More messed up than that is the fact that basically everyone's turned into zombies, including supervillains like Doc Ock pictured here. After every time they fight, Peter puts the villains back together again. But now he's being summoned by Reed Richards. When he goes into the Baxter building, he sees this horrific scene. Yeah, that right there is one of the smartest men in the multiverse. What the heck? The two argue for a while, and Peter decides he needs to find a new, stronger web fluid. So he takes a sonic gun to track down Venom, since he would have stronger webbing. However, when Peter finds Venom, he sees that Eddie Brock's life was drained by the symbiote. And in an act of kindness, the symbiote rejects Peter so he would live. Mr. Fantastic shows a new webbing that's even stronger, but it's made from his own body. Peter gets pretty desperate and uses Reed as new webbing, but he's still alive. Part 75. This is Police Captain Jean DeWolf, and this is how she lost her life. Jean was a close personal friend of Spider-Man. I know, big surprise, but just hang on. The story starts with her fellow officers finding her already passed on in her apartment. Peter is racked with guilt trying to find out who did this. Was it Duck Ock? Mysterio? Green Goblin? No, actually. And that's the messed up part. Because it turns out it wasn't a supervillain. It was a new character called Sin Eater. No powers, no gimmicks. Just a crazed lunatic with a firearm. Spidey works with this man, Detective Stan Carter, to track down Sin Eater. Peter ends up crossing paths with Daredevil after a misconception. And Sin Eater even tries to take him out. But he was actually going for a judge that Matt Murdock was close friends with. At one point, Sin Eater even tries to go after Betty Brandt. That's when we find out that all along, Sin Eater was actually Stan Carter himself. And he ended up taking out a superior officer. But it wasn't a supervillain, just a guy. Part 76. We're all familiar with Bruce Banner and the Hulk, but what about the time they separated? That's right, friends. In the comics, Doctor Doom was able to physically remove Bruce Banner from the Hulk, creating two separate entities, both of which able to live their own lives. After a while of being on his own, Hulk goes to a bar, in which he gets thrown through a wall by this woman right here, the Red She-Hulk. Otherwise known as Betty Ross, Bruce Banner's main love interest. The two of them start beating the crap out of each other, until they're interrupted by this man known as Orb, who tells them that he needs their eyes. So they stop fighting and beat the crap out of Orb, until they ask if they should continue their fight. One of Orb's henchmen asks if they're fighting each other again. That's what is revealed. Not quite. Instead, the two hulks start going at it. And go at it they did. For two hours in public. Then he was Banner again? Part 77. This is Darkhold Iron Man, and just like the Spider-Man counterpart, this is seriously messed up. But let me explain why. The story starts with Pepper and Jarvis finding Tony in his Mark I armor, but they can already tell something's wrong. They try to remove pieces of Tony's armor, until they remove one of his gauntlets and his skin comes with it. Frantically, they begin putting the armor back on, fearing they do even more damage. Tony says he's fixing his armor, basically turning it into a walking hospital that'll keep him safe. Time goes by and Tony continues to work on the project until Pepper finds Tony fused with his armor completely. White ooze leaking from every crack. They run some tests and it turns out he's permanently fused. He cannot remove it anymore. Tony made even more suits for people around the world. The Tony we know is gone. He even grabs Pepper and brings her to the suit he made just for her. This reminds me of something. Part 
Part 76. This is the Marvel Comics character known as Malice, but you may know her by a different name. That being the Invisible Woman herself, Sue Storm. And in this video, we're going to discuss how spousal abuse kind of saved her life. But let me explain. Sue's mind had been corrupted by a character known as the Hate Monger, basically bringing the subconscious dark side of the character forward, and more or less unlocked her true potential. So she was easily able to take out basically all of the Fantastic Four. So you might be thinking to yourself, Alex, what did you mean by spousal abuse? Let me explain. In order to get Susan's personality to regain control, Reed Richards begins just berating her by saying, Susan, I told you to be quiet. We will not indulge your foolish female outbursts. My man goes on an unhinged rant before he straight up pimp slaps her. But here's the thing. It actually worked and Susan was able to regain control. Part 79. This is Yabard Thon, otherwise known as the Reverse Flash. And although he's Barry Allen's biggest rival, he's also his biggest fan? Let me explain. The Reverse Flash is actually from the future, and he completely idolized Barry Allen, up to the point of getting plastic surgery to look more like him. He even recreated the same accident that gave Barry his powers, but something was a little off. So instead of tapping into the speed force, he technically taps into the negative speed force. Just roll with me on this one. Because Reverse Flash can't actually remove Flash from the timeline, if you know what I mean, he gets revenge by hurting every single person close to Barry. For instance, his mother. And Barry going back in time to stop this from happening is actually what creates Flashpoint. So the Reverse Flash is a character that cannot take out his main adversary. So he ended up ending his arch nemesis's mother, making it so the guy can't go back in time and fix it because it'll just create a paradox, which is why he can't take out the Flash in the first place. Part 80. This is the Ultimates issue 27. And in this comic, we see Reed Richards, otherwise known as the maker in this universe, do something horrific to Iron Man. But I mean, it's comics, it couldn't be that bad. Or could it? In the Ultimates universe, Tony Stark consistently hallucinates this boy, a younger version of himself that he calls Anthony. And he's basically able to fully interact with Anthony. And it turns out Anthony was actually a manifestation of a brain tumor. But was it really a tumor? Because it turns out that it was never really a tumor. In fact, somehow, inexplicably even to the writers, Tony was growing an infinity gem inside of his brain. So the evil version of Reed Richards has Quicksilver track Iron Man down, where he preps Tony for open brain surgery and explains that he's trying to prevent a cataclysmic event by taking out the Infinity Gem, but after some bickering, he just rips it out by force and leaves Tony to pass away. This is the Marvel Comics character, Dormammu, but you might recognize him from his appearance in the MCU. But in Ultimatum issue number four, he takes being a bad guy to a whole new level. While in a rampage, Hulk creates a magical explosion which seemingly kills Spider-Man, I know, big surprise, moving on. In doing so, he releases one of Doctor Strange's biggest foes, Dormammu. You can even see the Human Torch trapped in his necklace. Doctor Strange tries to step in to help, and the two begin fighting, until Dormammu seems to have the upper hand. ...control of Doctor Strange's clothing and begins constricting him, until, brace yourselves, we get this horrific imagery. Yeah, that is Doctor Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme, being crushed like a grape. Then Dormammu pulls an Andy from Toy Story and says, I don't want to play with you anymore. The worst part is, the other heroes don't even acknowledge it. You just saw one of your friends get crushed in front of you. Say something. This is Victor Von Doom. And in the comic series Ultimatum, he gets taken out. But how exactly did it happen? Let's talk about it. You see, this all revolves around Ben Grimm, the thing. You see, Johnny Storm was MIA. Sue Storm was in a coma. Reed Richards was doing Reed Richards things, and Ben Grimm was just done with Doom and all of his antics, so he went to Latveria to track him down. So he finds Victor Von Doom and says he wants to talk. Dr. Doom hits him with a vague threat, but realistically he's talking to a giant rock monster. He has nothing to fear. And while Namor is just chilling in basically a back to tank, the thing finally snaps and basically crushes Doom's skull. Namor is justifiably freaking out, and the thing kind of just no-souls the situation. But was it really Doom? Because you see, friends, it's actually alleged that it wasn't Victor Von Doom, and it was actually Johnny and Sue Storm's mom. This is Hitman issue 22 from DC Comics, and this story is called The Santa Contract. This story focuses on this man here named Bob. He was working as a janitor at a nuclear plant in Gotham, 
when unfortunately, a drunken man dressed up as Santa pushes him into nuclear waste. But he actually lives. Needless to say though, he looks a little different. He actually says, I can do stuff now, I can be popular. But he quickly realizes his power set might not really be suited for superheroics. So he turns on a freaking dime and decides to accept being a supervillain. His coworkers are terrified and they realize they have to call in a professional. But it couldn't be Batman because he's a little preoccupied. So as the comic suggests, they hire a hitman. That being the titular character, Tommy Monahan. So as Bob is just walking around melting people, Tommy and his friend Nat track down every Santa they can find and scare the daylights out of a couple Santas before finally finding Bob and just wreck him. All from the author of The Boys. <laughs> this is The Immortal Hulk, issue 33. And in this book, we see one of the most grotesque transformations the Hulk has ever had. Here you can see Dr. Robert Bruce Banner writhing in pain. They refer to him as Bob and ask him if he's okay. And he replies, that's not my name and begins screaming. Doc Samson tries to hold him down, but says, God, he's strong. And that's when we see fingers start ripping through Bruce's mouth. And as you can see here, they eventually start ripping him completely in half, with an entire arm busting through Dr. Banner, with the Hulk eventually busting free. And you can even see bits of Dr. Banner left behind. Hulk's back and he means business. You can even see Doc Samson holding what's left of Dr. Banner's head. And yes, while images like this are really disturbing, it's not actually the first time the Hulk has done something like this. Because as you can see here, the Hulk has been known to rip through Banner's skin before. This is the Green Lantern, Kyle Rayner. And honestly, the writers hate him. But let me explain why. We've already gone over the fact that his girlfriend got unalived off screen and stuffed into a fridge. But what about the time that he was assaulted by another man? Let's talk about it. It all revolves around this guy right here, known as Bueno Excelente. Kyle begins to tell Batman about how he had an encounter with this man at a Gotham City bar, saying that all he could remember is somebody must have spiked his drink, and all he could remember hearing was Bueno, Bueno, Bueno. And that would be this man right here, Bueno Excelente, who is a known predator, if you know what I mean. And all he says is bueno and excelente. So Kyle was just minding his own business and this happens to him. And how does Batman react to finding out a friend of his was assaulted? He says, are you finished? Recently, I've been covering the Ultimate Universe's Ultimatum. And today we're going over everything with Magneto. In this comic, Magneto shifts the magnetic poles of Earth, throwing the Earth off its axis and effectively taking out millions of people, including flooding Manhattan. But boy, oh boy, he doesn't stop there. He meets up with his old friend Charles Xavier and tries to explain himself, where, rightfully, Charles compares him to some pretty evil historical figures. So Magneto snaps his neck and removes Professor X from existence. Oh, by the way, he also disintegrates Wolverine. You can see his claws still stabbed into Magneto's chest. Yeah, that smoking pile that looks like Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru is what's left of Wolverine. But don't worry, friends, Magneto has a change of heart and meets up with Cyclops, who proceeds to obliterate his face. After all is said and done, Cyclops gives a press conference where he is subsequently removed from this Earth. But by who, you ask? Magneto's son, Quicksilver. This is She-Hulk, otherwise known as Jennifer Walters. And today we're going over the time she defended her former lover, Star Fox. Star Fox, otherwise known as Eros, has the ability to physically control people's emotions. And in this comic, he's being accused of using his powers to, let's just say, uh, force some grapes on people, if you know what I mean. While defending him in court, Jennifer asks Star Fox if he ever used his powers on her, and he refuses to answer. And it's established in the Avengers comics that they at least shared a night together. This causes her to snap and beat the brakes off of him. He keeps trying to explain himself, and she, rightfully, is just beating the crap out of him. But was it really justified? Because you see, it turns out he really didn't have control of his powers. In fact, thanks to Star Fox's brother, his powers are made uncontrollable, and his brother, is Thanos. Looks like the Mad Titan strikes again. This is Injustice issue number one. And we start off with Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen meeting up with who they believe is a councilman. However, after he shoots and takes out Jimmy Olsen, it's revealed to be the Joker. Superman goes to the crime scene and he sees his friend no longer living. But all he can think now is, where is Lois? Superman meets up with Batman to help find Lois, who enlists the help of the Justice League. Superman ends up finding them in a nuclear submarine, which he easily lifts out and shreds. But on board, he finds Doomsday, one of his most powerful villains. And the two begin to brawl, at which point Batman and the Justice League apprehend the Joker and Harley. And that's when the truth is revealed. That wasn't Doomsday he was fighting. 
He was his pregnant wife, Lois Lane. To add insult to injury, Joker rigs a bomb in Metropolis to detonate when Lois' heart stops. Superman lost his city, his wife, and his unborn child. But don't worry friends, Superman gets his revenge. This is Janet Van Dyne, otherwise known as the Wasp. One of the founding members of the Avengers and a victim of spousal abuse? But was that the original intention? Let's talk about it. In the comics, just like in the movies, Janet is married to none other than Ant-Man himself, Hank Pym. Or, as he may be known in the comics, Yellow Jacket. Yeah, it's a bit of a difference between that and the MCU, but let's roll with it. And in the most famous panel that this couple shares, you see Hank Pym slap the crap out of her. Let's be honest here. Janet even meets up with the rest of the Avengers afterwards and reveals her black eye. And subsequently, Hank is removed from the team. But here's the thing. That wasn't what the writer originally wanted to happen. Yes, you heard me right. Originally, this was supposed to be an accident, and the artist took it and ran with it. So Hank Pym became known as a wife beater because of a misconception. Part 91. This is the Wasp from Marvel Comics, and recently I talked about her bout with domestic violence, and how the infamous slap from her husband was an accident. However, this has been done multiple times before, and it wasn't an accident. Let me explain. In Ultimates Issue 6, written by Mark Miller, you can see Hank Pym slaps Janet again. And he actually is remorseful. Until... She elbows him in the nose and then hits him in the face with a piece of machinery. She bites him? He slaps her back. She shrinks down and begins blasting him until he hits her with some bug spray. Where she then goes to cower under a desk, where he retrieves his helmet and commands an army of ants to begin swarming her. He then just kind of has this blank expression about the whole thing. But really, what did we expect from the writer of the book where Aunt May cheats on Uncle Ben with his brother Richard, gets pregnant with a baby Peter Parker, gives it back up to the father and stepmother to raise, and then gets with Uncle Ben in the future. Part 92. This is Kara Zor-El, otherwise known as Superman's cousin. And today we're going to be talking about the time these two cousins got a little too close. Let me explain. Back in 1962, Kara, otherwise known as Superwoman at this time, was on a mission to find Superman a wife. And he said, if I ever did marry, he'd want it to be someone just like her. But he can't because they're cousins. Even though he even says some countries on Earth allow cousins to get married, gross. They can't because of Kryptonian law. But here's the thing, that doesn't stop every version of Superman. Let me explain a little more. Some versions of Superman aren't in love with Lois Lane or even Lana Lang. They're in love with his cousin. Yeah, just remember that these two in fact are from Space Alabama. They're fully aware of their blood relation and some versions even get married. Superman. Truth, justice, and the Alabama way. This is Luma Linne a character from 1962 who once appeared in Superman comics. You might be thinking to yourself, wow, she looks really familiar. Well, that's because she's basically a doppelganger of Superman's cousin, Supergirl. Now here's where it actually gets messed up. As you can see by this cover, Superman is madly in love with Laura Linne. And Supergirl here is commenting on how strange it is that she looks exactly like her when she was growing up. But here's where that's kind of BS. Because as I previously mentioned, Superman said that if he was to marry anyone, he would want to marry his own cousin. I know, crazy, moving on. It was actually Supergirl trying to find a wife for Superman that found Luma Lune in the first place. And she even says that this is a Superwoman duplicate of her. Meaning, they're still pretty much the same person. The two actually hit it off pretty well, which is not shocking considering they're basically related. But they couldn't be together because the Earth's yellow sun is her kryptonite. Part 94. This is Batman Confidential, issue number 18. And before we continue, let me explain how we get here. Catwoman and Batgirl got into a fight after Barbara Gordon stole her father's journal, which Selina stole from her. And after a bit of a fight and chase, Selina ends up ducking into a building, where it was a uh, no clothing allowed place. So Barbara had to adapt. Babs thinks to herself, what would Batman do? And begins to take action. She ditches her costume, except for apparently the mask, which, okay, and begins going through the club looking for Selina. Understandably, trying to avoid as many people as possible. She has eyes on target and begins to pursue. But she says she needs a distraction, so she takes out the lights. And she was able to get Commissioner Gordon's journal, before basically starting an all-out brawl. She then decides it's time to get out of Dodge and starts throwing hands like she's at a Waffle House. Even hitting someone in the face with a wired home phone? Okay. Before getting her costume and getting out scot-free. All written by the co-creator of Deadpool. This is Incredible Hulk, issue number 608. And in this issue, Red She-Hulk pulls one of the cheapest, dirtiest tricks on Domino. But let me explain. In this issue, we see that Domino, as well as Elektra, are fighting Red She-Hulk 
while Modok watches. Elektra throws some shuriken at Red She-Hulk, which just makes her more angry, as it kind of shreds her clothes. So what would a giant, fiery, red, hulking being do in this situation? Well, she does the only thing possible. She grabs Domino and rips her clothes off for no reason. I mean, really, she wasn't even the one who shredded her clothes. That was Elektra. Thankfully, Elektra comes in and saves Domino from being crushed at the last second. And Doc Samson comes in to rip out the side that Elektra put in Red She-Hulk's back. And the reason that she did all of this to Domino? To steal her clothes. But as you can see, they obviously didn't fit well. You know, bit of a size difference there. This is the Marvel Comics character, Squirrel Girl. And today, we're talking about the time she sent a proposition of sorts to Daredevil. Let's start this story off with a little context. In this page, we can see there's a history between Squirrel Girl and Wolverine, and it looks like it's a little more adult, if you know what I mean. However, it was later retconned that apparently he just stole a taxi from her. Okay, whatever, moving on. Squirrel Girl's pictured here holding the baby of Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. Later on, we see Daredevil interacting with Squirrel Girl. They're in the same home, and she's holding the same baby. And she wants to thank him for saving her. However, that's where things start to take a turn. She asks him, do you have a girlfriend? And he responds with, how old are you? Squirrel Girl then responds with, old enough to thank you for saving my life. Hey yo, what the fuck? You might think, Alex, that's not messed up, but she's like 14. This is Felicia Hardy, otherwise known as the Black Cat. And along with MJ over here, she's a long time on again, off again girlfriend. Spider-Man. And don't worry, friends, I can already hear you now. This really doesn't have anything to do with Spider-Man, but you'll see why. This all goes back to an arc called The Evil That Men Do, where we get a life of the college years of Felicia Hardy. We see on her first day, this drunk guy tried to assault her, and she was saved by this boy over here named Ryan. And needless to say, she was immediately smitten by his chivalry. The two of them soon begin to spend all of their time together, whether it be playing basketball, going out for a movie, studying, or going out to dinner. She said he was such a gentleman, and he might be the one. Except he wanted to take it a little further, and she didn't. But he did not stop. And as you can see by these panels, she wasn't able to stop him. This incident is what caused her to become the Black Cat and track Ryan down and take him out. This is the Black Widow from Marvel Comics. And, as we all know, one of her best friends in the world is Hawkeye. But unfortunately, their close bond isn't always a canon event. Let me explain. That's right, friends, and a surprise to absolutely no one, we're going back to the Ultimate Universe. It really is just the gift that keeps on giving. But let's continue. Hawkeye was in the kitchen with his family when there's a ring at the doorbell, which his wife goes to answer because she believes that it's the Scarlet Witch coming back to pick up her purse. However, she was absolutely wrong because it was a team of mercenaries that took her out on the spot before saying there are two kids upstairs. Go get them. And busting out the window of the kitchen where Hawkeye was with his son. Hawkeye tries to defend himself and rescue his son, utilizing the utensils around him. I mean, he even throws a meat cleaver at that guy. Good Lord. After taking out the remaining thugs in the kitchen, Hawkeye's son is taken out right in front of him. You might be thinking, what does this have to do with Black Widow? Well, she put the hit on his family, and he got his revenge. Part 99. This is Frank Castle, the Punisher. And today we're looking at the Marvel Max version of this character, so you know it's going to be fun. Let's get into it. Today's story starts off at the grave of his wife and two kids. And that's where we see this man, Nikki Cavella. Together with another thug, they record themselves digging up the grave of the castles. Meanwhile, we catch up with Frank doing uh, typical Punisher stuff. And of course, this is Marvel Max, so there's cursing and lots of violence. We then see a news report going over the fact that the castle's grave has been robbed. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say robbed, actually. As you can see here, the skeletons are exhumed. And that's when we see that Nikki Cavella urinates on the skeletons of Frank Castle's family. And this is Frank's face while this is all going on. Cavella did all of this just to get Frank's attention. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. So Frank tracks him down, blows his gut out, and leaves him in the woods. Once again, all coming to you from the writer of the boys. Throughout this series, we've covered some dark, disturbing, and downright foul moments in comics. We've come a long way in the last 99 parts. And in this, the 100th entry into messed up moments in comics, I wanted to do something truly special. So today, we're going to be looking at a twisted take on some of Marvel's biggest characters. That's right, friends. Join me today as we cover Warren Ellis's Marvel Ruins in this 100th episode special of messed up moments in comics that made us go... Hey, yo, what the fuck?
Sorry. This two-issue comic is told through the perspective of former photographer for the Daily Bugle named Philip Sheldon, saying he's writing all of this because it's all gone wrong. And it's pretty evident from the first page, where we see Sheldon looking up to see the Avengers Quinjet getting blown out of the sky by the United States National Guard. We are literally on page one and we've already seen the Avengers perish. Well, buckle up, friends. Because this is not the standard Marvel Universe we've all been used to, we are in for one bumpy ride. The story goes back a few years and discusses how Iron Man gained his iron suit. And it turns out, after helping end the Vietnam War, he went back to California, where the Californians are trying to overthrow the government and secede from the United States. A National Guardsman threw a grenade while Tony was there, and the shrapnel hit him. Originally, he went there to try to broker peace between the Californians and the rest of the United States, like he had done in Vietnam. However, this time, after getting hit with shrapnel from a grenade, pretty much galvanized him to join the Californians in their effort to secede. We see Sheldon looking at a copy of the Daily Bugle, which reads that a young boy named Matthew Murdock has passed away. You know, the character who in another world would have grown up to be Daredevil. But in this grim reality, he was given brain damage and radiation burns after being hit by that truck. Sheldon's approached by a strange looking man at the bar who threatens to take him out right then and there if he doesn't buy him a drink. And it turns out that, that strange looking man was actually Wolverine, who in this universe had been poisoned by the adamantium skeleton that he'd used as a weapon for so long. You could see his skin begins to rot and fall apart as it's slowly poisoning him from the inside out. But boy! Boy, does this story not hold any punches. As we find out that T'Challa, the Black Panther, ended up joining the Black Panther Party in San Francisco. Hawkeye ended up getting physically removed from this world by a member of the California military, and Scarlet Witch ended up betraying the Avengers and giving over damning information to the United States Department of Justice. So that way, she could be protected from any kind of repercussions for all of the heinous actions committed. We cut to a nuclear testing facility located in Nevada. You know, Basically Area 51. It's been turned into a Kree housing facility, more or less. The Kree have been housed there for years. Long enough for those who were put in there in captivity to have children. And have these walls be all they've ever known. But before he's allowed to visit the Kree civilization, he has to don a radiation hazmat suit. Once Philip enters the facility, he's met with a semi-familiar face. That being Marvell, otherwise known as Captain Marvel. No, not that one! In this universe, the Kree were on a mission from the Supreme Intelligence to take over Earth. And as they were on their way to, they ran across the Silver Surfer's corpse floating through space! Which, let's just take a minute to say how insane this panel is. And the justification for the Silver Surfer's death is that he was once a mortal and was used to, you know, breathing air. He didn't really know what to do in that situation and panicked, clawing open his own chest ending himself. Yeah, okay, sure, I guess that's one way to bench one of the most powerful characters in Marvel. But the power cosmic was still embedded in Norinrad's body, and radiated out and ended up cancelling out the Kree's cloaking devices, which alerted the nations of Earth to their presence, who took swift action and nuked the ever-loving crap out of them, blowing them out of the sky and disfiguring most of them. All of the surviving Kree were covered in scars, open wounds and sores, and cancer. Marvel even tells Sheldon that in 30 years, there will be no more Kree left, as they all would have been wiped out from the radiation. And this is when we find out that the President of the United States at this time is Professor Charles Xavier. And Washington DC has basically turned into a hellscape under his rule. Philip Sheldon ends up meeting up with an old friend, Nick Fury. But once it comes out that Sheldon's writing a book about all the heroes, Fury snaps, punching him in the stomach and tells him that he has no further connection with the Avengers, and he doesn't want any part of this. Sheldon tells Fury he just wants some information about Captain America, but it looks like Fury's had enough of this, and he's about to shoot Sheldon right in the face. When? Fury ends up shooting a dog that was about to attack Sheldon instead. It's then when a familiar face shows up, and it's none other than Jean Grey reduced to turning tricks on the street for 
and she solicits herself to both men before Nick Fury starts unloading his pistol right into her, ending her on the spot. And if that wasn't enough, Fury tells Sheldon that he's got to take a short nap now and says that he took out Captain America with a Patriot missile last week, then ends himself right there on the spot before it cuts to a bloodied magazine showing Galactus floating lifeless through space. Later on, Philip meets with Rick Jones, friend of Bruce Banner, the Hulk, and he recounts the day that the bomb went off, which normally would have given Hulk radioactive powers. We can see Rick sitting down playing his guitar as Bruce Banner comes flying in on a motorcycle trying to get him to go away, and they actually throw some insults at each other before Rick realizes that Bruce is trying to save him. And after he fell into a trench, he saw the atomic blast as Bruce starts to burn. His flesh begins to become dark and green, and tumors begin to erupt all over his body. But this is not the Hulk that we know. And the first issue ends with Phil leaving Rick Jones' apartment, finding the Punisher shot and bled out on the side of the road. Issue number two begins with Phil Sheldon sitting next to someone on a plane. They look very nervous and begin digging into their own skin. And that's when we realize this is Mystique. Yeah, you know, the same Mystique from the retconned origin of Nightcrawler, who's now apparently his dad, but that's a story for another time. Mystique began developing multiple personality disorder, which split her mutation, causing her to basically rip apart into multiple different pieces right there in the seat, until she kind of exploded with nothing left. Once the plane lands, if that wasn't enough, some feds push an old man in a crowd, who turns out to be Magneto. He was covered with a makeshift device that was confused for an explosive. However, it was very far from that. In fact, that was actually a device that Magneto was using to keep his magnetism at bay, and with it now destroyed, anything magnetic was being pulled directly towards him. That includes glasses, guns, fillings from people's teeth, the iron from these people's blood, everything, including the plane that Phil just showed up on. Until... After the airport incident a few days go by, Phil now visits a prison in Texas, where the warden is no other than Wilson Fisk himself, Kingpin. But this is no ordinary prison. The inmates seem to be the X-Men. We see Scott Summers locked up in a cell, his eyes fused shut, permanently blinded. Fisk begins to torture the poor man, smashing his hand with a club against a bar as he walks by. We see Nightcrawler survives by eating little bits of himself, a powerful mutant forced to self-cannibalize. We even see people like Quicksilver. He's had his arms and legs removed. And after a little bit of time, Phil's done being in that prison and leaves. We see in this world that Donald Blake is not actually the alter ego of Thor. In fact, he's just a regular guy who may have gone a little crazy, thinking himself to be the actual Norse god. And Emma Frost is now a cult leader. Great. Ghost Rider, still a stuntman, but this time, the way he gets his signature flaming skull look is by as actually lighting his own face on fire with gas as he does a jump. Honestly, this is probably one of my favorite alterations that they made in the comic, though. Phil reminisces about all of the different superheroes, but unfortunately, this is not the reality he lives in. We then meet up with Ben Grimm, who at this point is the only character who actually seems to have anything going for him in this universe. He explains how he met Johnny and Sue Storm and Reed Richards. But in this universe, he did not go on that fatal flight and they really didn't get powers. In fact, Ben Grimm shows Phil all of the photos of what was left of the bodies of what would have been three of the Fantastic Four. But there was no pictures of Victor Von Doom as the book winds down, we see Phil walking through the city. He puts his hand to his head, and we can see some weird scarring on the back of his hand. He said he really wished he had time to craft this book, but that weasel kid Parker stole his time from him. And that's when we find out what happened to Peter Parker. Let me ask you a question. Did you really think we would get through an entire two-issue story about every terrible thing that could have possibly happened to all of the Marvel superheroes with nothing happening to Spider-Man, the boy that's literally Marvel's punching bag. No, of course you didn't. 
They were just saving Spider-Man to the very end. And good lord, do they not hold back. They said that Peter was a lousy photographer, worked freelance to try to pay for his college tuition, was a know-it-all, and messed everything up by being bitten by a radioactive spider and got infected with a mutated virus. And before he started showing symptoms of this horrific skin-peeling rash, he showed up to the Daily Bugle and infected Phil, who, after recounting this story, collapses on the sidewalk no longer here. Gone. This two-issue story could have made up countless entries into this series of messed up moments in comics, but I wanted to make episode 100 a little special and cover the entire thing. And with that, we close the book of Marvel Ruins. Thank you so much for watching and being a part of these 100 episodes. It really does mean a lot to me, and if you enjoyed this, go ahead and leave a like. If you'd like to be a part of the ongoing series, subscribe for more. Feel free to leave a comment with your favorite messed up moments in comics. If you'd like to support the channel, consider becoming a member. New entries in messed up moments in comics are released daily, so check them out. And new videos are uploaded every Saturday. Once again, thank you to all of you who enjoyed messed up moments in comics so far. And as always, have a great day, and I'll catch you in the next one.